thank you for joining our panelists today. I'll be leading the discussion regarding value opportunities for handheld wrist wearables and body wearables, right? We want to define what a wearable is. On top of that, we want to really understand what is the need and what our customers, enterprise markets are looking for. So before we start our panelists, I'd like to introduce our panelists, um, our attendees, if you would like to come. Um, so I will go one by one. So Shelly Brown is our safety environmental manager at Econ. Mark Melanie is also a safety environmental at, uh, sorry Mark, I knew this was gonna happen. So he is at Caterpillar. Steve Labradaski is our research development and specialist at Con Edison. Um, you see the SO skeleton right here, uh, Keith Maxwell at Lockheed and Martin. And then we have also Brian Cobb, who works at the Cincinnati, um, the Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky Airport. So if you'd like to um, further do introduce yourself. Thank you, Denise. I don't have that. <laughs> Pretty damn cool. Uh, Brian Cobb, Chief Innovation Officer for CVG, Cincinnati International Airport. Uh, our wearables right now uh, involve using the Samsung gear uh, via a product called TaskWatch. So I believe someone during the uh, presentation earlier uh, yesterday morning discussed keeping the customer in mind. Our customer obviously is twofold. It's the individual that's coming through the front doors, a paying consumer. Could be an individual that's meeting a relative off of a flight. And it's also the employee that's actually doing the work day in and day out. In our scenario, essentially what we're using is a uh, data hub that's capturing the number of footfalls, the number of traffic that fall, goes into the restrooms. Subsequently, we send that information to the cloud. Cloud sends an information uh, notification back to the housekeeper that's wearing a task watch. Subsequently, the nearest housekeeper reports to that restroom, and if they're relatively new, then we can scale it so they immediately have a checklist on their watch. They go through that checklist, they clearly alert, make sure that the quality of the restroom is exactly as we would expect. They leave the restroom and now the quality is, is where we would expect for any consumer that's using that restroom. Um, from there, you can imagine the, uh, the wealth of data that we're pooling. Um, automatically, our scores in those particular restrooms that we initially did the beta test in, we jumped from an 87% to a 94%, showing a tangible improvement. And then immediately we start digging into ROIs from there. So that's kind of the, the very quick backstory. So uh, my name's Keith Maxwell. Um, I do have the coolest job. Um, I design uh, exoskeletons with a team uh, of engineers there at Lockheed Martin. And our objective until recently was mostly focused around the idea of how do we support uh, the military? Uh, troops on contact, on the ground. Um, and then what we did was we expanded that, that envelope, mostly because we had some success with the Army in terms of getting their attention and some funding to go ahead and develop uh, exoskeletons in that direction. Here, we're talking about commercial applications of exoskeleton technology. Um, places where, uh, again, wearables, things like watches and, and eyes, uh, glasses, those things are providing us with information, but they're not literally making us into supermen and women. They're not making us stronger. Uh, they're not making us more capable. They're not extending our endurance uh, in the jobs that we do. And so this system is really designed around the idea that I'm not gonna make you pick up any more weight than a human being can pick up. If your maximum uh, amount of weight that you can pick up is 185 pounds and do a squat with that, Terrific, that's what your capability is. If you can do that 10 times, that's terrific. That's your capability. When you put this system on, you'll be able to do it 70 times. And that's the difference, right? It's not the one-time event that gets you hurt. It's the repetitive nature of the things that we do every day. Those are the things that get us hurt. And so this system's about taking away repetitive injuries. It's about increasing productivity, um, but fundamentally, it's about making us superhuman. Places where our brains work, and this provides the energy. 
All right, uh, good afternoon. My name is Steve Lobachinsky. I am a specialist in R&D focusing on EHS related projects. A lot of it has to do with wearables, looking at ergonomics, looking at slips and falls, lone worker, and also following procedures. So with that said, there's a lot of different devices that are out there that help us accomplish those tasks as far as associated being with safety. Uh, there are exoskeletons, as, if, as Keith mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of wow factors with some of these devices. And when I say wow, that means this is great, but then after a week or two, people saying, listen, you know what, I'm very uncomfortable with this. I really don't want to wear it. So there's a lot of challenges with some of these devices. But with that said, too, I think with technology and things being miniaturized, uh, we're going to hopefully kind of bypass some of those challenges because they're going to be easier to wear. You're going to have longer battery life because that's some of the challenges as well. Hey, you know what? At the end of the shift, make sure you put this device back in to charge up. Uh, while this um, panel discussion kind of focuses on below the neck, I also do a lot of projects that are above the neck as well. And I do have one question for the folks that are out there. Who thinks that, you know, in order for something to be a wearable, it needs a battery? All right. That's actually fantastic. It doesn't really need to, to have a battery. Uh, if you look at wearables going back to, say, the suit of armor, uh, that didn't have a battery, right? But it was a wearable. It protected you from people like Keith, OK? And their, uh, and their fancy electronics. Uh, so I'm not sure how people react to, uh, to Keith 200 years ago. Uh, but that's some of the challenges. You know, I mean, where's the technology going? What are people doing with it? Um, and how do we minimize people getting hurt ultimately, right? Uh, also, as artificial intelligence starts to, to kind of creep up into our lives, what are we doing with that information? Um, what's kind of privy to us and what's not? Uh, also, when you start looking into kind of the wellness program, I mean, that information kind of has PII, right? So we can't kind of intervene and look at that information. So how do we have people involved in those type of projects? Do we do anonymous? That's something we've done in the past. Hey, you know what, are you guys tracking me with this device? Um, we say, no, you know what, pick any device, just remember that one number you've chosen and make sure you wear that same device. Uh, and that information now becomes kind of anonymous. We don't know, you know who's wearing it. So that kind of gives the, you know, the folks that are participating in the pilots, because that's my job is to kind of evaluate the new technologies. Do pilots ask for volunteers? You don't want to ask, uh, you don't want to force somebody. Unfortunately, you're going to get a false positive when you do that. Okay? Uh, so that's, I guess we'll pass it on to, to Mark. Can you hear me? Okay. I have very similar challenges, just so you know. Um, good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? Good. Uh, my name is Mark Melody. I work for Caterpillar. Um, I'm in the product support and logistics division. Um, so we have, um, you know, logistics facilities, we're moving parts all over the world. We also have manufacturing operations where we're manufacturing steel products and some rubber, rubber products as well. So we're about 70 locations globally. So we've got the U.S. challenges, we've got the international challenges. Um, we're involved in wearables, probably, you know, we've been, you know, I say messing around with it for here for a few years, trying different things. We're doing exoskeleton um, use and piloting in some different operations currently, so we have similar challenges. Um, our devices don't have batteries, so that's a little bit different, I guess. Um, but they're showing some promise and some challenges, so, um, you know, be happy to talk about those. Um, we're doing some wearables for, using some wearables for ergonomic assessments and some biometrics as well, trying to look at the industrial athlete as well. So how do we, when we bring new people on, how do we, you know, make them, you know, appreciate the importance of staying in shape and getting in shape before, you know, doing their, doing their jobs. And there's some privacy issues that go along with that as well. Um, you know, people don't like to be watched typically, right? So, um, so how do we make it um, value add for them and for us, so they're seeing the value in, in what they're doing to be healthier individuals and not get hurt, hurt at work. Um, but the ergonomic assessment piece, um, you know, it's valuable to us. Uh, so far, we're getting some good data back, and it's simplifying our operations, making it faster to do ergonomic assessments, um, allows us to focus down a lot quicker than we used to, um, takes away a lot of the paper paper shuffling and paper evaluations, so that's pretty cool and, and value, value add for us. So, um, okay. Yeah, All right. great. I'm ready to sign up for your ergonomics program there. That sounds, <laughs> sounds great. Um, I'm Shelly Brown. I'm a safety manager with AECOM. And if you're not familiar with AECOM, we're a global provider of engineering and construction services. Uh, we're about 80,000 people worldwide. I work primarily in our design 
uh, and Consulting Services Division. I'm located on the West Coast and work with our operations out there. So places like LAX and um, the Ram Stadium and um, and some of our utility providers in, in the West there. I, um, I come to this panel, I think two years ago, I attended the conference and asked a lot of questions of this panel. So they might have turned around and you know, ask me to join it, not to discourage question asking out there today. Um, but, you know, we at AECOM, we, I've seen in my experience a lot of progress made on the AR and VR as applications in our design and engineering process to enhance safety and, and efficiency and productivity on those sites. But wearables, you know, have been a little bit tougher of a, a nut to crack, so to speak, for us and getting the technology onto our work sites where we can learn more about our workforce and um, ultimately prevent some of the injuries and, and, um, and of course, fatalities that are occurring in our industry and, and really throughout the nation still. So it's a great topic and I'm really happy to be a part of this today, so thanks. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, um, as mentioned before, my name is Denise Grulan, and I'm a B2B product marketing analyst at Samsung. I've been at Samsung for about two years um, in the B2B wearables division. And what I've witnessed is I'm a little different because I'm more on the hardware side, but the importance of what wearables plays in the enterprise market, um, being that, you know, finding the need of creating an enterprise mobility management system to advance customization with our Knox configure. Also to providing a high level security platform with Knox security. And most importantly, working with their internal solution uh, team and solution partners to really provide our end customers with a secured, efficient, and productive device. So without further ado, um, I would like to start the panel with one of the questions that a lot of people have asked is, what applications are you looking for specifically when looking into a wearable device? I, I can start with that if you'd like. I, um, so we have very diverse operations at AECOM as you can, can imagine. We work in all parts of the, um, of the economy. So, one single device is not something that we're realistically looking for, but what we are looking for in, in our devices is some degree of flexibility and configurability um, in terms of what's being, um, what's being measured and even in some of the materials that are being used to construct the devices. So, oh, sorry. so we're looking at a whole, whole bunch of different applications. So if you start thinking about uh, mobility devices like this from the standpoint of a first responder. Um, you've got to go make access to a high-rise building. You're going to go climb however many floors are in that building to go get where you're going. This is driving down that energy cost on you. Your fatigue is much less. You get there much faster. You're fresher. Um, so that's kind of that idea. Uh, within the airport domain, your, your baggage handlers and that, they're picking up heavy things constantly. They're moving them. Um, we've had uh, this, this device itself inside of Bombardier. Um, we're doing work with our passive exoskeletons in the shipbuilding industries, aerospace, um, construction, mining, um, uh, uh, automotive. Um, so they're in a whole bunch of different fields. We've got them literally distributed around the world right now. So we're looking at a lot of different applications, but what we're really looking for more than just, you know, cool gee whiz programs where we put devices in and people evaluate and they test and they determine what they like about it, what they don't like about it, do an ROI uh, assessment. What matters more than that is I don't know your business. I don't know your business. I don't know what it is that you do. I know how to build exoskeletons. We have a team of guys who do this really, really well. What we are looking for is collaboration. What we're looking for is to be able to reach out into the industries and say, give us your ideas. Tell us what you need. Tell us what you want. What is your pain point? Help us to help you to go fix that pain point. And to do that, we're really talking about doing little consortiums um, in various industries. Pull that knowledge base in, give you products back. So what we're looking for is something that size of a quarter, all right? 
keeps everybody safe and costs 50 bucks. That's really what we're looking for. And I'm sure that's what probably everybody's looking for as well. That doesn't exist. Uh, but currently, some of the challenges that we have is, and I'm going to go above the neck uh, for a second or two. We have some hearing conservation uh, projects that we're working on. Also, there's some technologies for, as I mentioned, the lone worker, ergonomics, et cetera, et cetera. How do we get these devices? Because sometimes we may want our folks to wear three or four different types of devices. How do we get them all to communicate into one common platform, okay? And what do we do with information? You can have your folks wear, you know, four different smartphones for each device. Um, you know, so there has to be some sort of um, standard developed for these devices where they could all communicate. The other thing that's kind of interesting, and as I walk around here, I see a lot of smart glasses. So that kind of gives you an idea where, you know, what, what people are thinking about where um, kind of the focus is. But one thing that is kind of missing with that is sensors, uh, the sensor technology, all right? Uh, how can I have one sensor that could tell me what atmosphere composition is, all right? Uh, maybe looking at 10, 20 different gases. Also, can it pick up uh, something that's a hot spot, right? Uh, so also where there's live electricity. So, you know, that's kind of missing from that whole picture is how do we incorporate a lot of these things into one device and that it's, you know, it's, it's live, right? So as soon as it's dynamic, as soon as you get a response, it warns, the, it warns the person or the wearer of that potential hazard, all right? Like I said, at the end of the day, it's really to keep everybody safe. And there's different formulas for that because there's different devices. Not every device is going to work for every person, every group. Not every uh, situation is the same. So you're going to have to kind of pick and choose what works, what's acceptable. And, and it's amazing because, you know, we have different groups, different operating groups within Con Edison as a utility company. And to some groups, they're very open to a device. Other groups, we don't need it. Uh, so once again, it, it, you really have to target what, you know, what is the risk, right? And how do you mitigate that with the devices? And, and this is just really the start. I think uh, as things become, like I said, more miniature, artificial, artificial intelligence is being kind of brought into the picture. Uh, and electronics and technology getting cheaper and cheaper, or more cost efficient, really, is probably the better word for us to justify the use. I think you're going to see a lot of this stuff coming into play. And just a quick example, you know, as I asked the question about, you know, does something need a, a power to be a wearable? Uh, we're actually doing trials on a, a shoe that has built-in spikes, okay? So for our slips and, and falls during winter, uh, you would actually activate the spikes by kicking a little button in back. And that's something how to mitigate, um, you know, slips and falls that's really not high-tech per se. The mechanism's high-tech, but, the, you know, there's really not much electronic technology there. So I'll pass it along. Can I use those spikes for ice fishing? Yes, you can. Yeah, all right. Ice skating. For me, it's a little different. Um, I mean, a lot similar, but a lot different, I think, in a way that we have a, we call a safety recipe in our division, and a lot of our facilities follow a safety recipe. Um, this is such an emerging technology. You know, things are changing so fast. There's so many different options out there that I could, we could go and tackle all at once. Um, mm -hmm. And that 10 really doesn't tend to work for us because people want to be focused in on, on certain things, right? Um, so for me, I have to listen to our, my customers, I think, first of all. So my customers are the facility EHS managers, facility EHS leads, uh, facility managers, and then my team. Um, so what's going to get us the biggest bang for our buck in the, you know, the shortest amount of time based on our recipe? So our recipe could be you know, things around ergonomics, right? We want to do assessments quickly. Um, if we can't do assessments quickly, we can't make improvements to the workplace quickly. Right, some of the monitoring things. Um, so I guess that tends to be my focus. Um, so you can't, you know, with the old saying, you can't eat the elephant all with one bite, right? You got to take bits, you know, little bites at a time. Um, so each year in our strategy, we try to, yeah, you know, focus down. I guess that way. So, so rounding it out: uh, safety, security, and quality. Typically on the safety and security side, everything that's been mentioned before. In our environment, specifically in an airport condition, uh, we're very concerned about the, uh, about the security of, of, the, uh, of the facility. So what we're looking to do, and, and essentially what we've already done with the, uh, with just with the watch element, is if you can imagine, unfortunately um, in the US, we go through some circumstances of an active shooter. Uh, something that's very near and dear to our concern is that type of situation. Airports are soft targets, so we have to be prepared for that. If you're familiar with the Pulse nightclub scenario that occurred in Orlando, unfortunately, uh, several of, of the individuals that were involved in that shooting hit out in a restroom, and then they had to play dead. Worst possible scenario that you can ever imagine. In our environment, 
for a housekeeper, they're typically the number one contact of any airport. Why? Because they're noticeable. They're there, they have a cart, they have a uniform, they're wearing a badge, they must be connected to the airport, regardless of if they're a contractor or an employee. So immediately we have to recognize that that housekeeper is no longer just a housekeeper, they're really an ambassador on multiple fronts. So from that circumstance, from a safety perspective, we're very much looking for that employee to be able to handle those circumstances all via quiet communication and escort customers out to a safe spot and then be able to communicate in real time, know exactly where that housekeeper is and how many cu customers are, are, um, are held down with them in a secure environment. So the safety security. Where I'm going with the quality aspect is, is probably a little bit different where we have to recognize from a quality perspective, it's very much two different types of consumers. It's the employee and making sure that their quality of life via a wearable device is actually accelerated. They very much appreciate what their job is. We're making their job easier via the wearable. And subsequently, we're making the quality improvement for the frontline customers that's coming through the front door. Then I would accelerate into the final phase, which is that customer that's coming through the front door, how do we make their quality experience in the airport much better than what it is today? We all travel. We probably, many of us flew uh, to get here. Unfortunately, civility in airports is, is kind of lost its way on multiple fronts. We have got to figure out how to bring some of that back all the way down to the most important, which is the amount of disabilities that are accelerating into the country is, is off of a phenomenal chart. We have to recognize, especially in my environment, how do we make a facility more accessible to someone that has a disability? And are wearables the answer for what we could potentially see in the future? The exoskeleton. In today's environment, if someone needs a wheelchair that has limited mobility, they're still able to walk, but they have limited mobility and they just can't walk far distances, you have to rely on waiting for a wheelchair attendant, a human interaction, and a device, a wheelchair, to come and meet your need as opposed to could we create some environment where an exoskeleton is available on a rapid basis that that individual could actually pick up the device, wear it through the airport, subsequently get to their uh, travel location, use it there, bring it back, and then turn it back in. Again, imagine the, the possibilities that all of us in this room, because we're here for a purpose uh, for, for the conference, where we could take some of this technology going forward. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I would like to ask you guys also is something that I've come across with Samsung is, you know, what determines to move forward with a pilot? You have successfully deployed these wearables, and how do I move forward in moving, you know, the device into your day-to-day -day daily activities? So I, I'm probably the odd guy out. Um, we have a tremendous amount of flexibility in the airport space and, and actually have been chastised by some of my colleagues around the world um, where there's hardly any pilot that we have not taken on. Um, obviously cost is an issue. We wanna make sure that we're working uh, well, but then we're also specifically for CVG, we're specifically targeting a startup audience. Who is hungry for bringing in new technology to the airport? And how quickly can we pilot and scale something that demonstrates true success? So far, we have a portfolio of roughly 25 startups that were all in various stages of either full deployment or a uh, pilot stage. And it's very strategic in making sure that, again, we're looking at those three elements, safety, security, and quality. And that quality, making sure that we're addressing those two consumer fronts. So we've had tremendous success. We, uh, we don't anticipate that slowing down any time in the future. So if you're a startup, give me a buzz. So uh, we do a whole lot of pilots. Um, most of it uh, in the past uh, in the industrial space have been with our passive exoskeletons. So we'll put them into a shipyard or into a industrial facility of some type. And the customer will say, this is, this is what I think I want this to go do. And then decide to change the scope of the project. And at some point along that line, we're like, this really isn't what our device is intended to go do. And sometimes we've been positively surprised. We go, hey, this, this actually worked for that application. And more often than not, we're negatively uh, impacted. And they go, 
you know, you didn't build us a Swiss Army knife. And, and I'll be honest, if you look around and you talk to anybody who, do, who builds this type of technology, um, there are no Swiss Army knives. Um, right now, it's a purpose-built device. It does a thing very, very well, and it doesn't fly. Um, so, yet. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I mean, that's, that's, uh, we get these questions all the time. It's like, terrific, I can reach and support a, a heavy tool over my head for 30 minutes at a time um, and grind away at something. And then I have to ask, how often do you ever have to reach 30 minutes up over your head to go grind something, right? Because normally from workspaces, you do something and then you move to the next space and then you move to the next space. So let's not set ourselves up in projects for a failure. Let's kind of recognize what the workspace is, understand what the pain point is, and then let's start that, that, that discussion about what that project ought to be, because then I can go address your pain point. Uh, so going from pilot to, say, deployment is very, very challenging, to say the very least. Um, engagement is key. Uh, the folks that you're doing the pilots with, uh, you want to get their feedback. Uh, you also want to communicate that feedback with other people within your organization. We have approximately 15,000 employees, so for one voice to get that out there, a little bit difficult to say the very least. Um, but you know, there's different medias that we try to get out there to, to kind of get the, I guess, the, the news out, right? Um, but also you have to be very careful with certain pilots as well. If they go for too long, then somebody's going to say, hey, you know what, I noticed there's a new device that's out there. Can we do a pilot on that? Uh, so it, it is, it's, it's very challenging to get people to kind of say, hey, this is where we want to go. With. Because the other thing too, at least from the R&D aspect, is now you're transferring ownership. So where it goes from R&D into an operating group, now they have to handle the, the information, uh, keep track of the devices, et cetera, et cetera. And some people may be kind of you know, reluctant to do that because at the end of the day, it's like, okay, you create an extra work for me potentially. Uh, but it is, it's very tricky to get out there. I think if you have a device ultimately that works and you have the proper engagement, proper communication, you will get stuff deployed. But it could be you know, just within one group, two group. I think as, as a big organization as ours, it takes a while to get something fully deployed within the organization and just to even get the word out. And there's so much different technologies. And once again, you're doing a pilot, it could take a year or two. Um, something else that pops up, it could be half the cost or a quarter of the cost that does twice as much. Hey, let's look into that again. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a real life challenge, and I mean, it's good that the technology is changing fast, uh, but once again, you gotta be careful of, you know, you know, how much time you wanna spend on it, how much effort you wanna invest into this stuff, uh, and make sure you get the buy-in. That's gonna be key, all right? Um, as far as pilots go, it seems like we're always piloting something. Um, I've actually piloted things myself. Um, we've got division, other divisions in Caterpillar who have technology they use. We've got Cat Safety Services who does fatigue monitoring devices um, and employee detection systems. I've actually piloted some of those. Um, I don't drive a mining truck, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, right, some of the stuff. But um, other applications, I think, um, to your point, um, we tend to have people who are champions of certain processes, right, after we pilot them. Um, and they tend to be our biggest advocates. <coughs> to try to sell it to the other, you know, other facilities. Um, that seems to help us out a lot. It's not as fast as we like a lot of times, right? We pilot something. Um, so I think that's important to get those, um, to look at the data, show the data on how this project is benefiting, you know, whether it's worker safety, reduction in injuries, um, you know, or return on investment is really important, I think. So getting those champions to, to share that information, share those practices with other, our other facilities um, tends to, to help the process along. So, so what determines <clears throat> if we're going to move forward with the pilot? So, you know, there's kind of a big picture and then a specific um, example I want to use. So big picture, I think that the, the organization that's going through this has to be in a place where their kind of systems and processes are mature enough that the pilot isn't, you know, one more system that a project manager has to be monitoring in addition to, you know, a dozen other systems that they're 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 working with. So I think once organizations start kind of, you know, kind of make, turn that corner on um, consolidating their own processes, then adding things like um, like some of the software and um, 
platforms that host these wearables, I think some of that be can become more integrated as well, make, make taking this to, to become the practice um, rather than a pilot more likely. Um, my experience, you know, we've done a couple pilots with wearable technology. My experience at Acom, and, and this is pretty narrow, is that we've used, used these devices in scenarios where we have an extreme kind of unlikely high severity event that we're trying to monitor for. So a man overboard in a remote location or, a, you know, a fallen worker um, out in the desert, something like that. So. Fortunately, we've done these pilots and never, you know, um, had an event like that occur. So I think sometimes you end those and the organization is thinking, well, it's reaffirming something we already know. We didn't learn a lot um, going through this. And so, again, it's, it's a little bit of a cultural element of, of appreciating that. I think it's also getting the technology to a place where you are getting maybe a secondary benefit from those single event type um, type controls or devices. Uh, one more add-on to that. When what's the time frame? The average time frame when you know a pilot is done and there's no more use for that actual wearable. You know, in my world, there's a lot of variety. So we have some projects that maybe last, you know, it's a 15-year project that we really only go into the field four times a year. Or we have a, we could have something that's, you know, two months long and it's, you know, 10-hour work days, two shifts a day, and then it ends. So I think a lot of that depends on the application. And then also on the device, again, for like those rare events, I think maybe a longer pilot time would help us understand the benefit better versus something like a, um, you know, like an exertion monitoring system. Maybe we'd be able to get a sense of that over the course of a few shifts, what we were, we were going to get out of it. Great. Thank you. Um, great. So I would also want to you know, ask, can you explain a success story with a wearable pilot that uh, you guys determined the decision that you will be moving forward on using that specific wearable? What was it and why was it determined to use it on your daily activities? Sure, so uh, again, our, our use case was um, TaskWatch. So again, it's a Samsung device, Samsung gear. Uh, TaskWatch is the platform. Um, why we decided to go forward with it was, number one, the amount of data that we were pooling. Um, immediately, we realized that the, uh, here's the odd fact, the men's restroom on baggage claim receives the most use combined out of any other facility in the terminal complex. That's data we never would have collected before. Um, why is that important? Because it allowed us, as, as the staffing responsibility, to start moving away from just traditional pen and paper staffing into real-time need, uh, which is critical in an airport space. Again, many of you are travelers. You realize that um, things don't work according to schedule all the time. So we have to be flex flexible and nimble enough to be able to adjust staffing needs as, as required. The other element was certainly cost. If you look at the cost of a device to, uh, such as a watch that includes cellular service, and you, now you have the ability to actually communicate either uh, verbally or via quiet mode, then uh, what's the cost of that radio that we typically see on any airport employee's hip? Um, jarring that, uh, again, if you're not familiar with it, that, uh, that radio and all of the accessories, every bit of $2,000 versus a uh, wearable watch um, coming in at roughly 350 and over the course of time you can lower that uh, lower that expense um, that would include cellular response or cellular connectivity uh, and the last piece is quality again from an ROI perspective on the financial front we've, we've <coughs> established that the quality we were definitely able to establish the bump in results um, so now that pushed us into a scenario where 
going forward, how can we expand that capability to, um, to again, connect it directly to the, uh, the customer? Uh, the employee feedback was tremendous, as I shared with my colleagues via pre-conference, is that um, we tried the housekeeping staff thinking that that would be probably the first frontline uh, feedback that was going to tell us whether the engagement was either feasible or we're wasting our time. Uh, it was amazing that in less than two weeks, the amount of positive feedback that we started getting, knowing that we were on the right track and that we should push forward. So if we can do that, what other elements can we start bringing in from an enterprise management perspective all via a wearable device? So it is feasible, definitely accomplishable, and uh, I would encourage everyone to kind of chase forward. So uh, I, if I had to pick one uh, that I thought was the most successful of our pilots, it would have been up at the uh, Naval Station uh, Puget Sound. So they've got a, a facility up there that really what they do is they, they dismantle submarines, old submarines that have come in, big nuclear boats, and they take them apart. We have the ability to handle a heavy tool. Um, we had built a customized arm. Mostly we were thinking about overhead uh, applications, cutting, grinding, uh, any of the uh, uh, welding type applications. And that wasn't it, because they came back to us and they said, you know, we bought this $200,000 tool, and all it is is it basically looks like a vacuum cleaner, and it puts an electrical current between the head of the device and the steel hull, and it superheats this glue that these anechoic tiles sit on, and we remove those tiles. I said, well, what's the project entail? And they said, well, it takes three guys. It takes one guy to watch the other two work, for a little while until the guy who's trying to pry stuff up or the guy who's using this super heavy tool gets tired and then they swap. Okay, we'll give it a try. So we reversed our arm, put it back on the system, put it in the hands of the guys. We took it from a three person operation to a two person operation and we made them go 20% faster. Everybody liked it at the end of the day and so the Navy went ahead and they bought a bunch of these things because they had spent $200,000 on a tool that they couldn't use. Um, in terms of an application, a physical augmentation, that was, that's success. Um, that's that's kind of, that's the rare exception to the rule, the expectation that we're gonna go do one thing and we wind up doing something else. Uh, in other applications, when I mean, we talk about from the, the military perspective, a system like this, I'm, I'm, it's, it's built around the idea that I can move uh, a heavy load a long distance and not be fatigued, not be injured uh, in, in the process. And that doesn't sound, I mean, if you've never carried, uh, you know, a rucksack um, and body armor, um, if you don't really know what that job entails, uh, it's an 80 to 150 pound ordeal, depending upon your occupational specialty and what you do. That's how much load you put on your body. Take the average 19-year-old uh, soldier, he weighs about 165 pounds, put 150 pounds of load on top of him, and see how long that guy lasts before we break something. The I-9 data tells us everything we need to know about that. Knee replacements, cartilage, torn ACLs, torn MCLs, uh, cervical uh, collar injuries, ruck palsy, uh, again, because of that heavy load on the, the nerves, your hands go numb. Numb hands, rifle, not a good, not a good combination, right? Um, so, so when we looked at those, those problems and we started taking load off the guy by transferring it through this, um, that moved the needle. That, 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 that got General Milley, the four star who, uh, chief of staff of the army, to say, I want this, I want this in my, in my army. Um, and so a year ago that process began, and here we are uh, talking about it here. Uh, so we had multiple, I'm going to call them mini deployments, uh, of, ver of various wearables. Uh, sometimes it's a small group, hopefully other groups catch on, which has been kind of proven as well. And then you slowly try to get a, you know, from the mini to maybe a semi-mini or larger deployment. Uh, one success story that I'll mention is actually a wearable ergonomic device. It's the size of a pager. It has uh, various sensors in there. It focuses on back injuries, soft tissue um, back injuries. Uh, what we saw with that unit was basically a 40 to 60% decrease in risky movement. But why do we see that? 
decrease. Uh, because of the way that the device was set up. It actually has a vibration when a risky move was uh, done, and it warns that person that's wearing it. So it created awareness. You know, when you start looking at any of these devices that, uh, particularly, to have, you know, if you want to change somebody's habit, right, or the way that they're doing stuff, um, you know, you, you need to make them aware that they're doing something that is potentially risky. Uh, so that awareness is key. The other uh, variable to that is to obviously offer some other better movement or less risky movement. Uh, so we were, what we were able to do with this device is, first of all, uh, create awareness, right? Uh, change kind of behavior and hopefully change habit. But also we're able to identify some of the tasks that were also risky as well because we're able to kind of go back in the data. Uh, the device actually numbered, has, has number of risky moves that were performed during a time period go back and look at some of that data and say, hey, you know what? On Tuesday, we noticed a lot of people had a lot of these high risks. What was it? Once again, engage with the team, figure out what happened. We actually brought in people to kind of observe what they do. Uh, so there's an engineering aspect in there, but there's also kind of the, the PT aspect, right? Is there something that could be done better? Uh, use different muscles, maybe some stretches prior to doing that activity. Uh, but that's one, one small success story, but that's where it all starts from, right? You know, you get one, hopefully other people kind of uh, sign on and it continues. Oh, I have the microphone, so I'll... <laughs> okay, you know, it was interesting because I was thinking about um, pilots and, and I, I haven't actually had one, you know, really go much further than a pilot. <clears throat> um, so it's going to have no answer here, but as I was listening to everybody speak, you know, a really obvious one that I had overlooked that um, I think is a great example is the, um, the commercial and scientific divers that I have uh, working with us on the West Coast. They all um, use a wrist-worn device um, as opposed to, or maybe even in addition to some of the um, gauges and other monitoring devices that they had historically used. And I believe that technology has been around for some time and really has become sort of the industry standard in terms of monitoring your um, you know, your air consumption, your depth, your dive time, uh, and, and really honing in those dive plans to maximize efficiency underwater. Um, I wish one of them were here to give you a little bit more detail about it, but that's certainly one I, I think, you know, was probably, you know, a pilot phase a decade ago and maybe um, is, is, again, the industry standard today. So a good, kind of good model to think about. Okay. Um We've had, you hear me? Um, I would say we've probably failed as much as we succeeded in some of these pilots, which is I think a good thing. We've learned a lot um, along the way. I think that's what pilots are all about. If I can you know, fail in biometric stuff a few years ago and now things have changed so much, you go back to it and say, hey, how can we use that now? Um, which, which we are, so it's pretty cool. Um, we've had some success with exoskeletons and the ergonomic assessment tools that we're using so those have been i say successful because we've been able to change um, worker behaviors and improve the work environment so to me that's a win um, so we should continue to grow in this in that space i think and um, make our workplace safer and that's what it's about great thank you uh, before i go to q a i think i have a question that maybe the whole audience has uh, did you want to show us something with the <laughs> Do it. Ooh. No, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, like I said early in the thing, if the guy can do it, the system can do it. I can't do backflips. Um, so this system really is it's a powered system. It's designed around the idea that it's going to take load off. It's going to transfer energy around my joints. It's going to do those kinds of things. So when, um, when I do something stupid, like, you know, jump, I don't take the impact. Um, literally, what you see is a machine absorbing all that energy. Bounces it right around through me. So when I walk, it's not my effort. I'm putting in about 10% of the effort required to make this move. It's pushing me along. If I take a seat next to you, literally, I'm sitting. I can do this all day because it's pushing me up. Go ahead and put your hand right there. What do you feel? 
You feel torque energy going right through there. Um, and so that's, that's what this machine does. That's what it's about. It's conformal. It fits my body. It does what I do when I tell it to do it. So I'm still agile, as agile as I can be at this. How much does it weigh? 19 and a half pounds with its batteries. Um, and because it actually reduces my metabolic cost of transport, I'm less fatigued moving that 19 and a half pounds addition on my body than I would be just walking. So it's taking its own weight, plus all of mine, and pushing me along. It's a wearable robot. Thank you, Keith. Thanks. Uh, before we end for today, does, uh, I'll take one or two questions. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for this panel?